Honorable brothers and sisters, thank you for coming. We'll wait for a few minutes before we officially start today's lecture. Okay, let's start with our lecture today. Venerable brothers and sisters from the San Francisco Chan Center, everyone on Zoom. It is our great honor to meet everyone again today for the last class on the Vimalakati Sutra by Venerable Chansi before this class. We'll proceed with the etiquette first. First join, please join palms, bow. Bow to Master Sheng Yan, the founder of DDM and bow to the Venerable. In the previous class, Venerable Changqi introduced um, chapters I-7 of Malakirti Sutra. In chapter five, Amdra emphasized the idea of cultivating the causes. We should not only subdue ourselves, but also subdue others using pra prajna wisdom and expedient methods. Venerable also pointed out that how to use the liberation methods and non-duality methods to practice the real bodhisattva path when we encounter difficulties in our practice. Chapter six is the manifestation of the effects of practicing the right way. A master seed can accommodate Mount Sumeru, which shows the inconceivable and transcendental power in liberation that is of empty nature and at will. In chapter seven, it was emphasized that bodhisattvas should see through the living beings and know what they are, in, with what they are instead of following greed, hatred, and delusion. Bodhisattvas should cultivate their mind of compassion by seeing living beings as empty, which is the real benefit to oneself and to others. I'm sure you can, you all cannot wait to hear more about what is coming next. Now, without further ado, please join me to welcome Venerable Chansi to continue his talk on the Vimala Kirti Sutra. Thank, Thank you, you Diana. Much. Thank you for your introduction. And also you have uh, summarized uh, what we talked about last time. Today, we're going to enter into chapter seven, and that is how to teach the living beings and how to practice uh, the Buddha path. So the chapter seven is talk about how to uh, subdue the living beings. And chapter eight is talk about the Buddha path. Mm -hmm. The, well, we first uh, do it uh, through the uh, reasoning and the principles, and then we have to, the bodhisattvas have to be uh, among the living beings. And this is uh, what we talked about last time. Today, we'll go into the uh, second half of the chapter seven. Um, in this sutra, after you talk about some principle, it will use a manifestation to show it. And the way to manifest here is the appearance of the goddess who starts gathering flowers. So we use this visual manifestation to talk about how to subdue the um, living beings. So, and then, then we have this dialogue between uh, Sariputra and the goddess. So let's uh, take a look. So uh, there are two parts, okay. We have uh, uh, the goddess of scattering flowers, and then uh, we have the debate. So when the flowers were on uh, to the uh, bodhisattvas, the flowers will just uh, dissipate. But when it's on the, um, the svavakas, it will get stuck on them. So they have this uh, debate about uh, why is it that this phenomena happens? And then, um, about uh, form and the formless. Mm -hmm. 
so they also debate and talk about uh, um, skillful methods. And Sir Future asked um, the goddess, how come you don't turn yourself into a male body? Because uh, Sir, Sir Future thinks that uh, women or woman's form is uh, inferior and said, uh, since you're so powerful, how come you don't change yourself into a male form? And they, they also discuss uh, when uh, to become a Buddha. So uh, the goddess appear and start showering uh, flowers to everybody. Uh, using this empty room to manifest emptiness. So everybody disappeared, but uh, the debate uh, between uh, between uh, 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 Ver Verkerti and uh, uh, Manchu Siri was uh, very um, profound and uh, the goddess was very happy and she showed herself. So when she scattered flowers, okay, the flowers do not stick on the bodhisattvas, but uh, all the flowers, they start attaching to the uh, sravakas. And, and for the Sravakas, having a flower stuck on them, it's uh, pretty embarrassing. So they start discussing why. Mm -hmm. So the following uh, discussion is always uh, to compare uh, the Buddhas, uh, the Bodhisattvas, and the, the difference between uh, the Bodhisattvas and the Sravakas. So, How should we look at the uh, future here? We should not look down on him and look at him as the necessary role to compare. Oh, so uh, the Sir future thinks that this is not in the state of suchness for the flowers to get stuck on me. So this is the first mistake. The goddess asked her, why do you shake off the flowers? And he said, because it is not in the state of suchness. First, he has the idea of differentiation. And then he also wants to get rid of the, this, this form. So let's see how she uh, answered. She said that flowers do not differentiate. It is you that give rise to this uh, differentiation. And the uh, pure land is uh, manifest like this, but because uh, you have different thoughts, then uh, you look at it differently. Like the moon and the sun will always uh, shine, but for a person that's blind, you cannot see it. In here, when we talk about suchness or not in the state of suchness, um, it seems that the, the things get, the flowers get stuck on uh, the clothes. It's not in the state of such, suchness. It's an attachment to form. Because flower itself has no ideas. So we talk about that person that goes to uh, the Nongchan temple. And uh, when he got inside, he still have a lot of vexations. And Master uh, Sen Yen said that you brought the vexation in and it has nothing to do with this uh, temple. And that is because your heart has um, this idea of differentiation. That's why, uh, just like the uh, Savakas, they are attached to forms. And the Bodhisattvas, they do not have, have any sense of differentiation. They look at things through the Dharma nature and not just another form. 
so to be ordained, okay, the basic is that you cannot differentiate, you cannot, uh, the so-called suchness and not in the stage of suchness, they are all about form. The things are all equal, but if your mind is uh, against the Dharma nature, that is the difference. Once you are the ordained and you still have this uh, feeling of a uh, differentiation, then it is not in the state of suchness. Uh, for example, if you are fearful, then all these like invisible evil spirits will have the power over this person. Uh, I don't know whether you have read uh, the, the uh, biography of uh, uh, Master Sun Yin. He mentioned that once he uh, went to a farmland with his brother and he had to pass a, a bridge. And Sifu is very afraid of a uh, buffalo. So when he crossed, he's getting uh, very anxious and afraid. <laughs> So, because the uh, Sravakas are so afraid of life and death, they want to leave it. So, but then the more you're afraid, the more uh, you will be in, in the power of, the, of those things. There's, there's a saying that if you do not uh, care about all these things, so you're not afraid that all these things are surrounding you. Everything uh, in the past, uh, if you have like uh, problems or uh, hindrance or hurt, once you can get rid of them, they won't hurt you anymore. So the real healing is that if the same thing happened, you won't get hurt again. So the Sravakas, they're so afraid of life and death. So they want to escape this reincarnation. Therefore, they are actually suppressing and escaping instead of really see through the whole thing. Because within life and death, then you can get a nirvana. And they separate life and death as two sides. And they, everything is divided into two sides. So they divide a uh, uh, so-called pure and the defilement as two, uh, two things. But real uh, nirvana has to come from uh, life and death. So basically, all the outside phenomena, there is no difference in there. We are the ones that make the difference. So the Mahayanas, they look at, they see the uh, nature from the form. And then uh, all the phenomena are, are equal. But because the Sravakas, they have this differentiation, they, Analyze things, uh, analyze things according to the phenomena. So they are always attached to form. So we can see the difference. Because of, they cannot, um, 
they cannot, um, they are so attached to forms that they cannot uh, mingle the two and become one. And so uh, for the, for the Bodhisattvas, they from phenomena to their nature, and then uh, they don't discriminate. So nothing, they don't uh, attach to anything. And can, we can, we can, we can tell that the Bodhisattvas do not hold on to the uh, phenomena. And then uh, the Svavakas, they hold on to the phenomena through the uh, dialogue between uh, the goddess and the uh, Sarah So uh, you should have uh, some understanding about this issue. So from the, this dialogue, we can see the logic of this. And this is the key point for um, our practice. So now we have a, a whole bunch of uh, debate. Uh, Sir Future asked the goddess, how long have you been in this room? See, how long is already a phenomenon of our time, okay. But the goddess always answer through the nature. And she said that my stay in this room is just as uh, long as your liberation. And it's something that you cannot really say. You cannot say that I have been liberated for five years because with five years, there's four, five, three, two, one. Okay. The arhats ask uh, from the phenomena, but the goddess always uh, reply through the uh, nature, in the, the intrinsic nature. So how long have you been uh, liberated? If somebody asks you and you say, oh, 20 years. So at 20 years, there will be a, a, a difference between a long time or a short time. But uh, Sir Future, then he cannot answer. So he stays silent because it cannot be expressed. So the Sir Future, remain silent on this uh, question. So, so he's not mentioning Which anything. To divide the conditioned and unconditioned. When he was violent, he asked, why do you remain silent when you're so wise, which was kind of forcing her to speak? And then Sariputra said, what did he say? Well, I do not know what to say. He, he who is liberated does not express it in words. And then she commented, spoken and written words all reveal liberation. Why? Because for liberation is neither within nor without nor in between. So without using the language to talk about liberation, why do we need to express liberation without language? However, we know that language and liberation are actually equal. Can, you, can we all understand this idea? It's almost like we were in a really cold space and we need water. How do we get water? Because in this icy world, all the water is frozen. But if we need water, if in this icy world, it's almost impossible to get the liquid. But all we have to do is to 
melt the frozen ice and able to get water. So essentially, water and ice are the same and equal. So it's impossible to achieve the form of liberation without the language, because language and liberation are not one or two or dual. So these are the differences. So what is the key point in here? Because the goddess enters and initiates into the empty nature. So she was able to see the equality of all these phenomena. However, Sariputra was not able to comprehend and ask this question. Well, there is no need to keep from carnality, hatred, and stupidity to achieve liberation. Isn't it like that? Well, that means that Sariputra didn't really fully understand it. Well, because his idea is, I need to stay away from greed, hatred, and confusion to be able to achieve concentration and wisdom. And this is the idea and concept of the Sravakas or Hinayana. We would be able to exit the world to after we stay away from entering the world. So how did the goddess respond? The goddess said to those that are proud, the Buddha will say it is important to stay away from canality, hatred and stupidity in the quest for liberation. To those that are or not, he will say that the underlying nature of such is liberation. So we clearly know that there is a huge difference between the Bodhisattvas and the Sravakas. The Sravakas divided life and death into two sides. However, the Bodhisattva has would kind of integrate these two ideas and think they and treat them equally. Hopefully that will help you understand the difference between these two. And then Sarah Portia asked her, goddess, where have you gained and what have you experienced that gives you such eloquence? How are you so capable of debating? And then the goddess replied and confronted him. So he said, well, because he who claims to have gained or experienced is arrogant in the eyes of Buddha Dharma. Because if you say that you have, ex if you have experienced or gained, that is the indication of arrogance in the eyes of Buddha Dharma. So the fact that I neither gain nor experience anything did give me this eloquence. So without a perspective or position, I wouldn't be able to um, become what I am right now. So there was still a series of debates going on, um, which I will kind of jump and skip them. But in here, I, this is very interesting because uh, it kind of shows the features of uh, Vimala Kirtia Sutra because it's not only about rationalizing or talking about these ideas, but also showing them Well, through this question asked by Sariputra, which was seemingly rude, why do you not change your female body form into a male? So Sariputra asked this, this question because traditionally females have bad garmic roots and it's hard for them to um, be on the right path. Isn't that a really rude question? How did God respond? The goddess said, well, for the past 12 years, I've been looking in vain for a female form. So what do you want me to change? Well, this perspective kind of is focused on the, the nature instead of the phenomena or form. The nature is not arising, non-dying. So the nature is also non-female, non-male. So she said, well, having lived here for 12 years, I've never seen this idea of female form. How would you ask me to change my body form? Well, why is that so? Because this is like an illusionist or magician who creates an illusionary woman 
Is it correct to ask him to change this and real woman? Well, this idea is that when the magician kind of shows the magic and shows a form of a female, and then the audience asked him, why don't you change her into a male? Well, because it is an illusion. Well, there is no nature in female. How would you ask me to change a female to a, fem a female to a male? So that was basically a wrong question to be asked in the first place. So Sarah Putra asked me and then replied, no, because it is an illusion and has no real form. What can it be changed into? So basically that's what it means. Well, at this time, like I mentioned, the goddess kind of saw everything from the perspective of Bodhisattva and was away from the two sides. So was not able, so she didn't really see the difference between females or males. Everything was illusionary. So at that time, the goddess used her power to change Sariputra into a heavenly goddess and herself into a man resembling Sariputra. So this is what we talked about, about showing this manifestation. So all phenomena are also like this and has no fixed form. Every dharma has no fixed form. So why are you asking me to change my unreal female body? So that's why she changed Sariputra into a female body. So see on this slide, we can see that now the Sariputra is turned into a female, whereas the goddess is now in the form of a male. So Sariputra said, I do not know why I turned into a female form, who is very astonished because God has asked him, why are you not changing from a female form to a male form? Well, then the goddess said, Sari Putra, if you can change your female body, all women should also be able to turn their bodies. But all women cannot change their form because there is no fixed form. If you want to change the form, then there has to be a real form to be changed in the first place. But the idea that there is no fixed form means what no real form means. There is nothing that can be changed. So the goddess said, well, Sarah Putra, you're not a woman, but you appear in a female bodily form. Although they appear in female form, they're fundamentally not women. Because you, even though you appear in the female form, you're fundamentally not women. So when you're saying that you're not women, it does not necessarily mean that you're men. It means you're not women nor men. The idea is to stay away from the two sides. So this is trying to see or perceive females or non-females from the perspective of the nature as opposed to the form. And likewise, the nature of all the dharmas is also non-male nor female. And then the goddess kind of changed Sariputra into a male form and asked, where is your female body now? And then Sariputra understood this idea about illusion and said, well, the form of a woman neither exists nor is non-existent. So he was able to kind of initiate into the Dharma nature. If we're looking at the form, it's also existent, whereas it's also non-existent. So it's staying away from the two sides. It's recognizing that the form exists, but also recognizes that it does not exist because of the nature of Dharma. So likewise, all things are fundamentally neither existing nor non-existent. For that which neither exists nor is non-existent is proclaimed by the Buddha. Which was also emphasized by the Buddha. Well, can we all understand this idea of being everywhere, but also being nowhere? 
the nature in the nature is about the emptiness of the nature, which is to break our perception about fixed forms. And only when we can talk about these two issues together would we be able to understand and illustrate the idea comprehensively. If we talk about it in the negative term, it is neither existing or non-existent. So the essential idea is to be able to integrate the both sides and stay away from the both sides. And next, we'll talk about this Gong An, about Chen Master Dao when Venerable Jian Yuan. So um, when um, during a Dharma service at a local home, Jian Yuan knocked on the coffin and asked Master Dao Wu, is the man in the coffin, is he dead or alive? So what did Chen Master Dao Wu say? Well, if you, you were Chen Master Dao Wu, what would you say? Well, he said, no talk, no talking. I'm not telling you. Not talking about birth or death. You cannot say that he's alive, nor can you say that he's dead. So the disciple was very angry about this answer or reply. So they went back to the monastery together. And when, when they were at the gate of the monastery, he asked again, he asked the Chen Master Dao again, well, Shifu, what is, why is, is he alive or dead? If you're not telling me then I will beat you to death. And then Chen Master Dao said, well, then you have to come and beat me because I cannot talk about birth or death. And indeed he was beaten. Not long after that, Chen Master Dao died unfortunately, but it was not because of the, the beating, of course. And then Venerable Jian Yuan went to study with another Chen master and asked the same question. And then what did um, his shifu say? Well, I'm not telling you, I cannot talk about birth or death. And at that very moment, Venerable Jian Yuan became enlightened. Well, we've always covered so much about no talking. Are you guys all enlightened or not? So what is this idea behind the story? Well, that means that life or death, female or male, all these relativity and opposition are illusions. Well, is there a real life? If there is a real life, then there is no dying. Is there a real dying or extinguishing? No, because otherwise there won't be living or rising. So the nature is that is, there's no dying or living or arising. So the same with the idea about the relativity of males and females, we say it's non-male nor female. When we're saying this in our daily conversations, you'll be able that, to understand this is an initiation into the real Dharma, the Dharma nature. Is that not funny? Okay. Uh, now let's kind of talk about chapter eight on the Buddha path. Well, in the chapter seven, let's kind of review briefly what we covered in chapter seven. In the first half of chapter seven, we talked about um, seeing through the living beings because living beings they are not able to see that they are empty in nature so we'll be able to help living beings to understand that the nature is empty this is about benefiting others well in the third part is is because we have to rise compassion for the living beings so um, we need to help living beings while not being afraid of life and death when we are in the cycle of life and death. So this is about these ideas of reasoning and principles, which is the first half of chapter seven. The second half of chapter seven is the dialogues between the goddess and Sariputra about changing the forms of female bodies and about liberation. So essentially it was about one idea, which is after we initiate into the emptiness, everything should be equal and treated equally. And every Dharma 
and every living being is also illusionary. So the message that uh, was trying to be delivered was essentially the same. It's just because um, the first half of the chapter was about reasoning and principles, whereas the second half was about showing the phenomena or talking about the reasoning through showing the phenomena or manifestations. Okay, now coming to chapter eight. So chapter eight continues uh, to chapter seven's idea. And upwardly, we have to uh, go into the Buddha path. And so this question is, how does uh, Bodhisattva go on to the Buddha path? And the answer is that if you go on to a wrong path, then it is the Buddha path, which is quite shocking. It, Buddha path, there are two uh, uh, meanings. One is the Buddha way, and the other one is a path. So one is a way and one is a path. So when you're on this path, then you can gradually arrive at the Buddhahood. So everything that you do uh, while you are trying to reach this goal. And then eventually you reach the goal. This is called uh, arriving at the Buddha path. Uh, this question, there are two angles to it. The first is, is there a misunderstanding about uh, the Buddha path? For example, in the Heart Sutra, it talks about everything is like illusions. But if a, a Buddha way or Buddha path is you have or you don't have it, and it's not complete empty, there's still a point where you can start. And the second point is, how do you uh, avoid the hindrance and the obstructions while you're on this path? Uh, you can uh, avoid temptations and all this, but how do we do it? How do we not going on to the wrong path? This is uh, important, isn't it? So, So uh, this question seems very important, but then the very most uh, courteous answer is you should go onto the wrong path. And normally we would say that you should leave your wrong path and go onto the proper path. Then how can you say that uh, the wrong path is the right path? So here, uh, there are uh, very he has to talk about the why the wrong path is the right path. And he has to tell us what is the wrong path first. Because all the living beings that suffer from vexations, we are all on the wrong path. And it is almost the opposite of a Buddha path. There's a saying that the Bodhisattvas are afraid of cause and living beings are all afraid of the result. So when the Bodhisattva goes along with the living beings and then uh, have all the sufferings and receive this uh, result, then I know about the course, and then I will go towards the Buddha path. 
if I want to create a pure land, since all the living beings are on the wrong path, how can I go onto a path that is different from them? The roads that uh, living beings are embarked on are all um, very rugged and hard to tread. So how can I go onto a smooth, smoother path? You know? So the second part is telling uh, where a bodhisattva should go and what is the so-called wrong path. Uh, this part talks a lot about um, the uh, living beings that are in vexations and the places that they are in. So, to a bodhisattva, the so-called wrong path and right path, they are not like absolutely two different things. For instance, if I want to go from Taipei to San Francisco, I can fly towards the east, I can fly towards the west, and eventually we'll still arrive at the same place. So if you pick a road that is not smooth, you still can reach your destination. So uh, all dharmas are Buddha dharmas. Okay? It's like a good person, if he uh, make friends with some bad uh, guy, the bad guy eventually will turn into a good person because of this friend. Mm -hmm. So, Verma Kurti asked uh, Manjushri, what is the seed of a Buddha? Is there a DNA for the Tathagata? So this is the, the third question. And the, the fourth part, is the virtues completed by following onto the Buddha path. So this is the structure. The first part, very uh, clearly answers, and the uh, second part is answered by Manjushri. Okay, we will get into the second part. Uh, you have to understand this first. You cannot get the cup without entering a tiger den. If you don't get into the, uh, dive into the deep water, you won't get a deep sea treasure. Without the silt of vexation, pure lotus cannot be grown. And without mingling with the living beings, you cannot teach and change them. So a Buddhistava wants to liberate not only just the ordinary, the, the living beings, but also the Hinayana followers. So they can change from Hinayana to Mahayana. So they use, they use a kind of appearance and not the, just the, the real thing. So they will appear to be in, have uh, a greed or anger and uh, folly, but it's not the real thing. The Slavakas, they uh, were uh, leaning towards uh, emptiness so uh, oh, usually when we talk about six parameters, actually there are 10. If you, if you understand this concept, you'll understand uh, chapter eight. If I want to achieve uh, Buddhahood, we should start with 
the living beings. Where there are the living beings, we should be with them. So the, the chapter itself is very long. So let's sum up. Uh, first, they have to go into the uh, five rooms. Okay. And this is uh, to teach uh, the living beings. And the uh, obstructions there will be uh, all this uh, greed and anger and hatred. Mm -hmm. And the obstructions, first is the 10 perfections. Okay. This is to teach the Bodhisattvas. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like uh, Master uh, Dong Chu, he shows uh, anger towards uh, uh, Master Sun Yan. If you have read uh, Master Sun Yan's uh, biography, you know that when uh, Master Sun Yan was reordained a second time, he did not have a um, the, the clothes of monk. So he asked the uh, master, don't you, I don't have the proper clothes. And then he was scolded harshly. And then uh, master, don't you gave uh, him a very small uh, piece of clothing. And uh, master said, yes, oh, this is too small. And then he was scolded again. So, and Master uh, Dong Chu also asked the uh, Sun Yan Shi Fu to uh, just move folks around in a, in a study. And he asked him to do so many times that uh, Master Sun Yan got angry. And then, uh, and then uh, Master Dong Chu told the uh, Sun Yan and said, oh, you are angry. And then uh, Master Sun Yen realized. So through all this harsh criticism and scolding, there is uh, a wish to help and to uh, benefit. So I remember uh, Master Sun Yen wrote uh, some letters to his uh, disciples. And he said that those uh, that are working have to be able to accept a complaint. And those that are really doing work will have to be bear other people's um, criticisms. So when the Bodhisattva descends into hell and shows all these uh, um, hatred and things like that, okay, it is the aim is to help and to deliver a living beings. Just like uh, Master Dong Chu show all this anger and uh, scolding to help um, Master Sun Yan. So the a Buddhist also will show uh, like poverty or um, deformed and all kinds of uh, things just to help and deliver the living beings. So what is the DNA of a Buddha? So DNA, you know, we all know what it is, okay? And this is the, we have this kind of gene, so we will look like this. We have uh, this brain, we have uh, two legs because uh, there's DNA in, inside ourselves. And so 
for a Buddha to be a Buddha, is there a DNA for that? Here, we talk about uh, the seed of, uh, of Tagata and not the historical uh, Buddha. Okay, we're not talking about the son of a Sudahodana and a Mahamaya. We're not talking about the historical Buddha. We're talking about the DNA that every living being has. And here, this is another very big turn. So we know that a Bodhisattva uh, stay away from the two side Dharma. So all vexations are equal to, to uh, purity. Here, look at that. They say that uh, with a body or with um, aphidia and with uh, greed, all these are the seeds for Buddha. That, make, that means that all these vexations, all these wrong views, all these bad deeds, they can be the seeds of Buddha. And even more extreme, you're not talking about that, uh, you're not talking about that you can find a, a peace in vexation. It's not talking about uh, there are, uh, the, a Buddha is uh, wrapped up in a, uh, in a um, waste, it's not like this. No, he's not talking about this. He's talking about this so-called purity comes from the defilement. The good can also, can only be grown from the bad And this is like really extreme, isn't it? We can look at it from one point of view. Uh, before we talk about that, we let's look at here. Okay, the answer uh, that uh, Manjushri gave includes the thesis, the argument, and the example. There, a lot of people do not understand what the cause and the, uh, if, and the conditions are. So for living beings that have a very strong a hold on the self, so from this thesis, we talk about, we use an analogy to explain this. And uh, it was praised by uh, uh, Kasapaya, Kasayapa. So Kesayapa is uh, the Mahayana and feels kind of a bit of regret for his own uh, Hinayana. And, why, and we have to understand why all these uh, so-called bad things are the seeds for Buddha. So there's a, this book, it's called The Survival of the Secrets. And it's, it's written, um, it's written by a Sharon Mohan and it's talk about DNA. And it talks about which DNAs 
are passed down to uh, humans and the reason behind it. And all these DNAs uh, can cause a lot of uh, heritage uh, disease. Just like a type uh, one um, diabetics or the uh, so-called uh, G6PD de deficiencies or uh, hemochromatosis. These, all these diseases are passed down from uh, the DNA. Why are these uh, DNAs be continued to us? So from this, we can also try to understand some form and about the Buddha's DNA. Oh, because time is short, let's uh, take a break for five minutes. And uh, since it introduces a lot of different diseases, we'll talk about from the, uh, from the uh, point of view of a DNA we can see why this DNA is passed down. Okay, we'll talk about it later and let's have a break. So we'll, be, we'll come back at uh, uh, 8.02. With a uh, new book that we started to read recently. There was a very interesting idea in this book. Why do these all genes, when we see them as diseases, but they were able to help human beings survive in the human history? And they were kind of selected and passed on from generations, which kind of illustrates the idea that those who are adapted to the society can survive ultimately. All these different diseases, um, blood disorders, plaques. We know that GP, G6PD deficiency and diarrhea also um, have to kind of pass on. Well, if we look at the example of diabetes, we know that um, in around 13,000 years ago in human history, that was the end of the glacier period. And with the, the globe was starting to get warm to enter into the next period. So that results in all the melting of the, the ices and uh, human beings were able to enter to the continents. And not long after that, another glacier period arrived and all the continents were again covered by ice. We know that human beings were able to survive for some period of time, but again, glacier period arrived. So those who were able to survive the glacier period were those who could stand the coldness. Do we all know the story about diabetes? It's because the sugar in the blood is really high and that would make us really confused and sleepy and not so fresh. That has to do with, um, well, the second type of diabetes has to do with our eating or eating habits. But the first type of diabetes is pretty genetic. We know that the sugar in the blood of those who have diabetes, how they survive the glacier period in human history. Have you heard about um, this I, story about growing grapes, the vineyards? I, I don't remember what it's called. All those grapes were really afraid of freezing or coldness, right? Um, or frosting in wintertime because all these frosting coldness would kind of make them have disease and not be able to survive. And in the past, you know that we want to make really sweet red wine or grape wine. We kind of collect the grapes after the first frosting period because when the grapes 
encounter with the coldness, all this water would be released. And then the skin is not so smooth anymore and the sugar would stay in the grapes. And the sugar, the amount of sugar or the percentage of sugar would rise afterwards. And that would also increase their ability to encounter coldness or frosting. We know that 100 degrees Celsius would be able to boil the water, right? Well, maybe there is also a certain point in temperature that kind of frees the grapes. The water that contains a lot of sugar is not easily frozen. Well, I'm sure that uh, in countries where there are warm climates, when all these vessels are frozen and when they get warm again, they're easy to be broken. So that's why we put some ingredients or um, inside the vessels to be able to help them defeat the frosting. Well, the same with the kind of frogs in the North when they feel like freezing point on their skin, they would get, they would put all the water in the body in their belly. And then that will make the level of sugar increase in their body. So when it was really cold in winter times, this water with a lot of sugar will protect their blood vessels. Well, we know that medicine is not so developed at the moment. Well, in the future, when it is developed, maybe we can use all these rationales and reasoning to be able to help those recover from their diseases in the future. Well, the reason why the technique is not so developed is because when people are kind of cold and the vessels, when they get warm again after being frosted, Will, bro will break. So in during that glacier period in human history, those who had diabetes were able to survive among their peers. And they were the ones that were chosen in history. And that is what we call DNA. But the second disease is hemochromatosis. It's the kind of disease that's exclusive to the Vikings. We know that they were living in really cold areas and they were in charge of um, the sea borders in Europe. And they were living upon very limited food. So they, could, they had to release all the irons in their bodies and they were all suffering from the hemochromatosis because we know that iron is an essential ingredient, right? Nutrient for us human beings, right? Is yeah, it's a um, element, and we'll lack blood if we don't really have enough iron. We know that on the lakes and oceans that we see are very blue, very beautiful. What does that mean? Well, that means there are no fish inside those oceans or rivers. But if the lakes kind of shows that they are a kind of green, that means there are lives in it because there is iron in it. Because all these living things or creatures lived on air and they were able to survive and live in such lakes or oceans that have a color of green. And we know that um, a small fish would eat the plants and then the big fish would eat small fish. So iron is not only needed by human beings, it's needed by all the living creatures on earth. But if we don't really have that enough iron, then human beings would get anemia. But if we have too much iron, then all the organs in human beings would able to release the extra not unnecessary iron in the body 
So those who suffer from this disease would possibly die from their heart failure before middle ages. For example, the failure of kidneys or livers. And if there's too much iron, their organs will experience failures. We know that when we have anemia, our face turns pale, but too much iron, it also results in death. So why does that kind of pass on? Because the Vikings had didn't really have that much nutrients. So they were able to kind of sustain the iron inside their body to feed, to support the organs. But those who suffer from hemochromatosis, they have these characteristics or features that the kind of cells in their body are against, always fighting against irons. So even though there is a lot of iron in the body of those who suffer from hemochromatosis, there are kind of cells in the body, nutrient, the, the immunity cells in the body that are fighting against iron. So we know that immune system would be able to tackle all the viruses or bacteria coming in and then get rid of all these viruses. Have you all how heard of about Trojan Wars? And the plague? This because when all these viruses became, it came into our bodies, all these um, cells would fight against these viruses. So for those who have herochromatosis, uh, the irons would be um, included in the cells and then would be able to help those who are attacked by these bacteria. So at that time, those who didn't really have that disease, um, they were not able to survive. So who could survive from those periods of time is the next, the generations that uh, of the Vikings that have uh, homochromatosis. That kind of helps explain when the first wave of bubonic plague came, there were so many people dying from it. But the second wave came in, there were not so many people who died from it because there were more people who had hemochromatosis that survived. Well, initially we think, well, this disease is not good, right? If we cannot identify the disease, then the one who has it will possibly die before middle ages. And those who have it, they will have to uh, get rid of some blood periodically to be able to survive. So if we kind of think about it and understand the DNA of Buddhas from this perspective, it, will, it might be easier to understand. Well, in the story, in a Buddhist story, well, when the tree is very huge and the fruits are really huge, like the fruit of Buddha. And the reason why they become so big is because it's the nutrients from the roots. So living beings are the roots of those who can become a Buddha. Well, if there is only root, can there be a fruit? Well, no, not necessarily. We'll have to water the plant, right? So what is the causes and conditions? It is the water of great compassion. Well, we use water to kind of help the roots and help the plants to be able to raise fruit, harvest fruits. So that's why in the Vimalakochi Sutra, it was mentioned that all this defilement would actually help grow purity. Well, this book is really good and the translation is very beautiful. It's it's very interesting in the way that it not only talks about these different kinds of diseases, it also mentions the idea that we're all afraid of growing old, right? And there is a part of our DNA that explains why we grow old. 
Well, human beings are very smart. We kind of, we kind of lessen this part of the DNA to be able to live longer. But there is one thing in there is one thing in the that we can use um, to help people lengthen their lives. Well, that kind of explains from the genetic point of view that the seemingly bad things are not necessarily always bad. They have their own specialties and there is a reason why they can be passed on from generations to generations in human history. Well, in the Vimalakoti Sutra, how was uh, Vimalakoti kind of explaining why these uh, defilement was the seeds of the Tathagata? Well, I kind of emphasized like all these vaccinations are the seeds of Buddha and they were able to see all these vaccinations just like our ordinary living beings see really defiled things in our lives that we want to get rid of very quickly. So they were not able to cultivate this body mind. And we know that we always want to stay away from sorrows and sufferings to be able to achieve enlightenment. So in this idea, it kind of tells the reason that, well, if the water is too pure, there won't be any fish surviving in the water. So there is no, so if we want to cultivate the body mind in the Sravaka point of view, we will enter into the suffering. Well, if we enter into um, the right way, then we won't be able to cultivate this body mind. Well, the, the fact that we can see living beings is almost like we can see this Mount Sumeru, so we can cultivate our body mind to be able to get Dharma. So to cultivate body mind is the seed of the Tathagata. And what is the seed of Tathagata? Only if we, that we can want to get rid of all the vaccinations will we be able to cultivate the seed of Tathagata. So if we look at it from this perspective, the living beings that kind of do bad things actually have better seeds become a Buddha to be enlightened. So it's again, a turning point that's kind of counterintuitive. So here is the analogy, which is very beautiful. Only in the silt, default silt, can we hear the Dharma. It's almost like we're planting in, planting in the air, there won't be any plants that can live on it. And we have to really plant them in the default ground well, they would be able to flourish. And another analogy is that we won't be able to get all the precious jewels without diving into the great seas. And similarly, we won't be able to get all these precious treasures without diving into the seas of vexations. Plants cannot grow in pure emptiness. On the contrary, defiled compost can provide more nutrients. So again, Vimalakirti keeps giving us all these turning points. So again, Mahayaka Sapa exclaimed, so we're no longer capable of developing a mindset on enlightenment. So, when, when we are uh, one of those uh, living beings that are still in vexation, we are even better than those arhats in terms of our chance to be a Buddha. Uh, 
for example, is like um, a seed that is already cooked or the root is already rotten, then you cannot have uh, flowers grow out of it. Uh, if you cannot uh, have uh, nutrition from the five uh, uh, desires, then you cannot grow. You can uh, so this uh, so called the uh, good uh, soil is just like the the five uh, desires. From that we can grow this proper seed. So. Even when uh, we keep uh, flip-flopping on the road to Buddha uh, as the living beings, we still have great hope to become uh, a Buddha. So we can look at here, this is a summary from uh, uh, Prakna Paranita Sutra and the uh, Bala Amala Kirti Sutra and Lotus Sutra. From uh, the Pregna Paramita Sutra, once you realize the path to stream entry, you cannot turn. Uh, all, we have all these uh, uh, different, um, different uh, paths into the uh, great vehicle. We have this uh, eight uh, positions. Once you uh, enter into the stream, yeah. and of course, uh, the idea is that uh, we should have this bodhicitta. And in uh, Vermakirti, we talked about you and you have entered. If you enter the unconditioned place of awakening, still you cannot. Uh, you still cannot uh, uh, achieve this uh, uh, the great vehicle. Mm. Those who see the unconditioned and enter the place of awakening cannot resolve the mind for this uh, unsuppressed, uh, complete uh, enlightenment. But we also can uh, understand the so-called unconditioned place as the fourth uh, As the four, uh, the four, the fourth kind of disciple. Mm -hmm. So once you're there, uh, you can no longer raise your bodhicitta, and of course, the hope is that we can use, uh, well, we can um, eventually go back to the Mahayana. But in Lotus Sutra, it's different. It thinks that. Uh, eventually, you can still reach from uh, the uh, uh, Savaka's position. So the parable of the manifest city is that there are two vehicles, okay, and both eventually they will meet and will become one vehicle. So those are like different point of views and to see whether you can turn away from this small vehicle and get to the great vehicle. And it's just uh, trying to tell people not to be too limited and have to have this bodhicitta. And then we are now entering into the, the ninth chapter. And in the previous chapters, the structure is that no matter whether you are subduing yourself or subduing others, you have to use non-duality. And the, the non-duality gate, why do we use the word gate? Because without a door, you cannot leave, go in. So a door you open and you shut, that means when you open, then you can get in, you can receive. So while you are 
trying to subdue yourself or others? How do you reach the final result? You have to go through a gate. And that's, you have to enter the Dharma gate of non-duality. Once you enter this gate, then you can uh, help others. You can uh, adorn the, pure, the Buddha land. And no matter which buddhi uh, path you come from, you have to be attuned to this uh, Dharma gate of non-duality. So let's uh, go to the second uh, PPT. So we are going to the chapter nine. And we always need to have this non-dual character to show uh, the inconceivable use. So the whole structure is no matter how you go onto the Buddha path, you have to use the non duality gate. Okay. So what is duality? So first we have to understand what is dual or what is two. But in the numbers, it means it's bigger than one. In uh, mathematics, it means uh, it's bigger than one. But we're talking about a kind of um, opposite, okay? You have this, then you have that. If you have you, then you have me. So things are in the, from the opposite point of view. And this is also what we call differentiation. When we, when there's an object that we can see or here, then we have this differentiation of whether it's good or bad or beautiful or ugly. So this is the first level. We can all feel it. We, all, we all have always experienced these. But the second level is when you have this object that we see or feel or hear, then there has to be a subject. That is the, uh, the dual opposition of the object and the subject. And that is when we have a thought coming up, our second thought will try to go and cling onto the first thought and thought that this first thought is real. So all these oppositions are the phenomenon. No matter whether it's uh, you try to differentiate whether it's uh, the, of, of the object, whether it's good or bad, or a differentiation of object and subject, these are all so called dual. dual. So Everything that we can understand, we can see, they are all like uh, in opposition. And since I'm talking about dual, it's in opposition, then why don't I use the word one? Because the opposite of uh, relativity is absolute and that's one. But why do you think that I don't use the word one? That is because if you say after the, if you leave this uh, duality, then there will be something that's absolute. And then people will start clinging onto this so-called absolute. And this is still also an inversion of a uh, living beings. You saw that if there's no dual, then there's only one. And that will, 
make uh, all the living beings misunderstand and thought that there's something absolute. That's why I say using the word one will cause a lot of misunderstanding. So Master Senya said, you not only have to stay away from either side, you also have to stay away from the middle. So you cannot cling onto the so-called middle. Why are living beings trying to um, cling onto one, the oneness? Okay, let's look at this picture. Now, when I draw a circle, how many circles do you see? I'm already saying I'm drawing a circle, one circle. But the truth is when you draw one, okay, two, three, four, five are all embedded inside. When you look at this, there's at least three circles. The first circle is that, that blue line, this, this circle. The second circle is the white one inside. And the third circle is the circle that includes the blue line and the white uh, part in the middle. So we have three and then actually four, five and six are all here. So is there a, something that is absolute? No. Because you cannot say it or name it. Once you say it and name it, it's no longer absolute. So if you leave uh, the duality, the result is not one or absolute. So the real duality, there's no opening. So what is the real duality then, a non-duality? And that is the emptiness of nature. You cannot talk about it, you can just say it. It leaves all language, everything, the opposition behind. And this is the so-called non-arising. And it is in tune with the non-arising non Dharma. Okay, here we have uh, 33 uh, Bodhisattvas telling uh, us what is non-arising and what is non-duality. And it is this inconceivable uh, non-duality. We mentioned about the so-called gate. And, and gate is the, or door is the way that you can enter or leave. When you are attuned to the gate of non-duality, then all the wondrous skillful method will be shown in front of us. So first we have to understand non-duality is above all these oppositions and it cannot be spoken. And then we have to be in tune with this non-duality gate. before we can start having this great compassion. So the question is, if this is so profound and cannot be mentioned, then how do we do it? How do we initiate into this gate? We cannot pretend and we don't, we keep silent and pretend that we understand. No, we cannot do that. 
we have to start from a real form, real phenomena. And then we have to understand that the, the so-called ordinary and the sage are the same. But we have to understand that we have not reached that point yet. So we have to start with the real phenomena. We have to first understand what is due and understand that it's not a real so-called due. So here we have 31 Buddhisavas using language to tell us how to be in tune with uh, non-duality. So we have good and evil, luck and bad luck. But we have to see through this and know that the Dharma nature, they are equal. Were there two sides? If we, it's not like we're dispelling the two sides. We know that there is evilness in the virtue and there is virtue in the evilness. This is how we enter the idea of non-duality from the phenomena. And all these bodhisattvas would take turns to talk about how they entered non-duality through duality. Remember last time we had a question from the Bodhisattva that um, when there is goodness, there is virtual, there is evil, right? It's relative. How are they defined as evil or virtuous in the first place? Because there is cause and condition. And if we see from the very, very root of it, we know that there is virtual in the evilness and there is evilness in the virtual. So there is no absolute virtual or evil. So the 31 Bodhisattvas wanted to show the idea of non-duality from the phenomena. So they had to use language and speech to illustrate the idea. So now let's take a look at the structure of chapter nine. Uh, at the beginning, Ramala Kirti asked the Bodhisattvas present to share their understanding about how they entered the gate of non-duality, right? They used language to explain that there were two sides. However, the two sides are equal so they enter the duality. Well, they can dispel one side or both sides and then enter the gate of non-duality. And then Bodhisattvas asked for Manjushri's comment. So Manjushri said, well, you cannot use language or words to express the idea of non-duality or through the process of question and answer or through our cognition and thinking, which was using language to spell language. And finally, Manjushri invited Vimala Kirti to explain this idea and comment. And Vimala Kirti just responded with silence and not saying anything. And this is very different from Sariputra silence. When we remember this conversation between goddess and Sariputra, Sariputra replied with silence because he kind of regarded Nirvana, um, is divided Nirvana and the conditioned. However, here the silence has a different implication. You'll have to start from the understanding of using language to explain non-duality non and then build on that with mental stories using language to spell language, there comes the level of Imala Curtis response with silence. So first of all, let's take a look at um, mental Let's kind of jump into um, Mandrasuri's reply without explaining the bodhisattvas using language to explain um, non-duality. Then here I would like to emphasize about Mandrasuri's comment about using language to spell the use of language. When all things are no longer within the realm of either word or speech and of either indication or knowledge and are beyond questioning answers, this is initiation into the non dual dharma. So Manjushri asked me, Malakurti, how were you able to enter the non dual dharma gate? 
what is the idea of uh, neither speech or word, neither indication or knowledge? Well, if I say and ask you, what is the left side? I would point to my left side. However, yours would be uh, the opposite to mine. So the idea of left side, can it be explained using language, right? If you use language to explain it, that means that you have a perspective, you have a position. But what about Dharma? Dharma is universal. If you have a perspective and position, you will not be able to demonstrate it, the nature of Dharma, because there are limitations to language and speech. So, so Dharma is without leaves and stays without words or speech. Because once you talk about it using language, it will be constrained by it. Remember that when we're saying that if you draw one circle and if you have, if you commit that action, there are more than one circle and no longer is Dharma anymore. Well, what about indication and knowledge? Well, indication is about manifestation. Well, it's about pointing as a manif manifestation to show the nature. So this is about a, talking about the nature through showing or indication without talking about it. Well, this is just my, my hand or finger pointing to the moon, but not moon. And finally, knowledge, knowledge about knowing. Well, is Dharma, can, can Mara be known? Well, if it can be known, then it's not Dharma anymore. So it's not like someone can say and talk about it, then you get to know about it. Your knowing is different, is dependent, is different from what he talked about or someone else talked about it. So of course it cannot be asked or answered. And finally, Vimala Kirti responded with silence and not saying a single word. And Manzo Sri replied, well, this is the true initiation into the Nandor Dhamma gate. Well, you know that um, Mazu Dao Yi in the Chen school is a, like one my great milestone in history because before that, all these reasons and principles we explained using language and speech, all the knowledge of the teachers was shared with the disciples using language, using speech. But after Mazu Dao Yi, it's about direct awakening immediate awakening or understanding it. It's not about transmitting knowledge or passing the principles to the disciples. So what were the ways or means used to help students become enlightened? For example, like striking or scolding or shouting at the disciples or using all these other methods that are not in the form of language or used to help the disciples understand and become awakened. So is it the Dharma in nature? Again, it's manifestation and indication. Once you really see the moon, that is the actual awakening with the Dharma. So all these language and interactions are not Dharma in nature because Dharma is without language or um, we say these interactions or means of manifestations. But all these methods, cannot be used to comprehensively illustrate dharma. So here is a story. Well, once an abbot at a temple was uh, going to see a lay person, the lay person was going to challenge the abbot and the abbot was very um, confused and annoyed by it. And at that time there was a sales, uh, there was a person who was selling tofu and said, well, let me take on this challenge and confront the lay person. So this person who was, who's, who was used to selling a tofu to this temple, and then the lay person came, also arrived at the temple. And the lay person was very surprised to see the abbot 
why are you so early? And then gave all this expression of 10 fingers. And then the adult responded with five fingers using one hand. And then the lay person used three fingers in response. And finally, the person who sold tofu used one finger as a response. And this person who came to the temple was very happy and thought, well, I was awakened. I was helped by the abbot. And then others asked him, how come you say that the abbot is awakened? Well, because I asked the abbot, how would you handle the 10 bad deeds? The, and then he responded with, with five precepts. Then how do we have handle the three um, baddies like hatred, greed, and confusion? Then he responded with one finger, meaning one mind or unified mind. So the abbot asked the person who was selling tofu, how did you handle this challenge with the lay person? And then he said, well, when he came, he gave me these two hands of 10 fingers. How, how much is the tofu you're selling? And I said, well, uh, when he was, he was trying to say that it was 10, uh, 10 cents for one cube of tofu. Uh, let me see if that was Shi Kuai. Oh, he was asking how much is 10 cubes of tofu because he was selling tofu and he would assume that anyone who was asking him was about the idea of tofu. So I replied with one hand of five fingers indicating five yuan, five kuai. And then the layperson used three fingers to bargain and said three yuan. And then the person who was selling tofu respond with one finger said, well, you're very greedy and craving. So this was kind of illustrated without language, but using all these gestures and indications. And there were all these misconceptions going on where one person explained one thing, whereas the other person interpreted it in a different way. So even with language and all these interactions and manifest manifestations cannot demonstrate the nature of Dharma and particularly this idea of not being able to spoken or talked about using language. So before Mazu Daoyi, they used this idea of using language to illustrate the state of enlightenment and Dharma. And afterwards, they, used, they started to use sharp questioning to help awaken the disciples immediately in a moment. But these were not the nature of Dharma. So Dharma is not only about staying away from language, but also staying away from sharp and questioning and all the other means of indication. However, we know that all this language or indication, they are not the ultimate Dharma, but can we de negate, deny the functions of it? No. Well, in the exposition on non-self in Vamala Kirti Sutra, the Dharma methods, these 33 bodhisattvas speak of are all necessary processes towards Buddhahood and a shortcut to one's non-rising. Well, we know that there is a function to language, right? We can The bodhisattvas can use language to talk about the ways. Without the fingers, we won't be able to point to the moon and understand the concept of finger. So is language important? And text important. Well, language and words are essential, are important. And then he asked, well, he said, um, in the in the Sutra, Mantra story said, talked about using language to spell language. Well, if there is no language, there is no point in, in dispelling language. Well, language is regarded as drags, which means that they are not useful. Well, if we kind of dispel them and use, and if we collect them and use them to process, and then we can, we're able to get a delicious wine or, or vinegar. So we were able to get the essence of it after getting rid of the drugs. So we know that, well, there has to be some drugs in the first place to get the essence. Right. So in the first place, we talk about using language to talk about non-duality. And on the second level, we were able to use language to spell language. Well, in the third level, 
using silence to dispel the use of language is the idea that with correct understanding, different paths will still lead to the same result. In the past, we know that when we're trying to unify, when we're trying to unify all the measurements, right? No matter what kind of vehicles you were using, no matter that was a cart or um, a cart led by different animals, all the wheels, if all the wheels were, were the same of the same size, you could uh, move freely on the road. So the idea of different paths leading to the same result is that we would always need these tracks to be able to get the destination. So we cannot deny the functions of language or words. We know that when we're in the seven day retreat, you would have to stop talking, right? We, we mentioned about these functions of not talking or speaking, right? This is the first level. But if someone speaks, right? The venerable would tell him, shh, silence, right? No talking it was still demonstrated using language or gesture, right? So we know that sometimes when the venerables, when they stopped others from talking or speaking, can we get to this atmosphere of silence? And this was achieved through using language and manifestation. So the idea of different paths leading to the same result has to be built on the first two levels, right? So if someone asks you what is initiation of non-duality and you respond with a silence, it will be hard to comprehend. It has to be built on the first two levels. Okay, now let's briefly cover the 10th chapter. So Sariputra was uh, worried about the new time is here and there's no food. So Vermakirti went to uh, the kingdom of uh, various fragrances uh, using his own um, illusionary himself to go to the kingdom to, to get the meal. And then all the bodhisattvas in the uh, fragrant land want to understand uh, who the Buddha of our land is. So the Buddha of the uh, fragrant land said, you should not look down on uh, these uh, people. So you are not uh, you are not supposed to look down on them, because uh, the Buddha over that land have concealed his power to deliver the living beings in that land. So the Buddha of the fragrant land uh, told all the Buddhas there that um, the Buddha in uh, that land is as powerful as they are, but then he just uh, hid himself among the living beings. So uh, through this uh, chapter, we can tell, uh, we talk about the inferiority of the impure land. So how does it show that the uh, Pure land is much better. And that is to use the inferiority of the impure land to show the superiority of the pure land. So the second part then, it uses the difference between the pure land and the impure land to show that the pure land actually also has its superiority. Because the merit of trying to practice the Buddha path in this defiled land is much, much, much bigger and better than in a pure land. So this, the content of this chapter is talk about the pure land is great because 
it doesn't need the language to teach. But in the impure land, using very strong methods and uh, teach those in uh, this defiled land, the marriage is much bigger. So using the difference, we show the superiority or the inferiority of uh, these two lands. So here, that's another big turn. If you are already inside the uh, non-duality, you have to show the ma majestic side of the Buddha. But then no, it turned around and say, even in the devout land, it is still su superior because the uh, creatures there are very strong-minded. And then if you can like deliver them, the marriage is really great. So the Buddhas over there ask, how do I practice Buddha path in an impure land? There are the eight uh, Bodhisattva methods that you can create a pure land in an impure land. So let's look at this. Because uh, this, uh, the living beings in this land are very strong-minded. So you have to use very strong uh, methods and, and talk about cause and effect and tell that uh, good and evil are relative. And then you have to use this um, almost like a scare tactic. And then uh, tell about the result of all the deeds. So once you see this uh, result, the living beings are afraid of this result and they uh, do not dare to create a cause. So how do you prevent yourself from a uh, getting this uh, bad result. And that is, you have to do good deeds then. So using so-called good and evil um, to teach. Well, in the uh, fragrant land, they don't need to do that. They just allow you smell the, the fragrance. So why is it, why is it uh, uh, superior in terms of in the, in the uh, default land? Because those living beings are so hard to, de to deliver. And uh, also you, we have this so-called the pen virtues, okay? This, the six parameters, uh, to receive the, the poor, the angry, okay, the ignorant, etc. Uh, and and teach the uh, Dharma to the to put an end to the eight difficulties and also teach Mahayana to those who are delighted in the uh, Hinayana. So here, all these show the superiority of doing a practicing Buddha path in a defiled and impure land. Okay, because of uh, the time constraint, let's uh, conclude. So this sutra is telling how Vimakirti uh, how to practice the Bodhisattva path. Mm. 
there are three angles. The first one is you have to uh, get rid of uh, defilement and the, the attachment. So you have, to, for example, if you want to cook something, you have to wash uh, the, the utensils and the uh, and, uh, uh, pots and pans. And uh, then how, how do you um, use wisdom and uh, compassion to subdue yourself and help others? And after, once you know the, the non-duality, you can have the inconceivable uh, uh, and very uh, the skillful methods to deliver the living beings. So, and the, the last part we, he talks about the non-duality gate. It's like it, he opens a door and uh, talks about the result of uh, pure land and using this um, fragrant land as an example. So the Sravakas should uh, give up this uh, Hinayana and go towards uh, Mahayana. And the ordinary uh, living beings should start raising the Bodhicitta. So uh, the next chapter, um, it is taught by the Buddha himself. And the last chapter is about how to spread this uh, Buddha, uh, this uh, sutra. So there are three points. If you want to go to the pure land, you have to practice a Buddhi path. So the whole sutra is about the pure land, Buddhist, Buddha, Buddha path, and the non-duality. So uh, we'll stop here. Uh, thank you for your audience. And because of this course, we can review this uh, sutra. Thank you very much, even though we have um, passed, we're past the time, but um, we still want to give this opportunity to everyone to ask questions. If you have any questions, you can raise hands in Zoom or type in your questions in the chat. Okay. Well, it appears that we're past time. Well, thank you very much for your cooperation that we can conclude our courses within our time constraint. Now let's warmly welcome Venerable Changxing for thank you very much, Army Tour for. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to attend the talks by Venerable Changxi on the Vimalakuri Sutra. Uh, I have personally benefited a lot from the lectures. Well, it's amazing that Venerable Changxi could finish the major ideas of the 10 chapters of Vimalakuri Sutra within four lectures from the very first chapter on and with examples, illustrations, and we'll be uploading the videos onto Facebook and YouTube and um, hope that we could still continue to watch those videos to review the lessons uh, and to think about how we can practice Bodhisattva path and um, to initiate into the Dharma gate of non-duality in our daily lives. Thank you very much for the breeze 
of the Dharma brought by Venerable Chanxi. Our gratitude also goes to the interpreters and the IT team for their hard work. And every time at the ending of the uh, our Dharma courses might be a conclusion of our study, but could also serve as the beginning of our practice. In this way, uh, we know that this Dharma gate of non-duality makes us not attached to our vexations while letting us still be with vexations. And we do hope that we can all maintain our straight mind and bolder mind and to be staying in the pure land and hope all the audience who are online can learn from studying Dharma and can devote themselves and grow from studying Dharma. We're looking forward to seeing Venerable Changxi next summer in San Francisco Chan Center. Please come visit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the good wishes and encouragement. Okay, let's start with the etiquette. Please join palms bow. Bow to Master Sheng Yan, the founder of DDM. And bow to the venerable. Thank you very much. Okay. Finally, well, after all these four lectures, we know that um, the Bodhisattvas and volunteers have been translating the lectures. And after the conclusion of the course, we'll be uploading the videos onto Facebook and the website use, with both Chinese and English versions of the videos. So you're all welcome to find and search these videos online to review these classes. And you're also welcome to share them with your friends to benefit more people. Amitofo. Okay. Now you're welcome to enable your video function in Zoom to greet the vulnerable and other participants. Thank you very much. See you next time.